Sharon. Hey. Thank you so much for being here and chatting with me. Let's start with just hearing a little bit about your background and your career trajectory so far. You know, I've been a chiropractor and an acupuncturist and a functional medicine doc for 40 years. Wow. And I recently changed gears and now I'm only doing functional medicine with a little bit of acupuncture. COVID has kind of gotten in the way. I do a lot of Zoom work. It's my passion. Anything that will empower people to be the best version of themselves. I use saliva testing, tongue diagnosis, which I can do over telemedicine, urine analysis. I also use lab work just to get a big picture of a person and then make recommendations. And they're usually steeped in lifestyle. So. I'm really, really interested in talking with you today about women's hormones. I know that there's a lot of conflicting vague information out there, a lot of questions. One of the things that people don't understand about hormones is they all interact with each other. So it's important to understand the interaction and that's why you need a health professional to help you. And what do you think are some of the first signs that you've seen in patients that lead you to believe there might be a hormone imbalance going on? It's usually fatigue, can't lose weight, and I'm trying, foggy thinking, can't get pregnant, I'm just not myself anymore or I'm losing my memory a little. I know that for a lot of women, they will go to their general practitioner with these symptoms and it will get dismissed as, you know, you're just getting older, so you're gaining weight, or you're a new mom, so of course you're tired. Right. Why do you think that that is? Because they're harder to track. The doctors are looking for diagnosis and therefore a remedy. There are some more forward-thinking doctors, functional medicine specialists, naturopaths, chiropractors with a, a functional medicine, or even acupuncturists who look at the whole person. And I think these are the best people to go to. They can also be an MD. It's just they need to have that, I'm looking for the subtleties, the gray area, not the black and the white. Another thing that makes me really irritated is when women who are struggling with their weight get the information that, well, it's numbers, it's all math, it's calories in, calories out. It's watch what you eat and work out and you just gotta do the work. When really, I mean, I'm someone who's always struggled with my weight. Really, there's more to it. There's more to it than just calories and workout. There's a f more full picture. Can you speak to that a little bit? What is going on is often that we're inflamed. We have toxins all over our body and these toxins are enrobed in the fat. And so you've got fat, of course, we know that, but you've got toxins. And until you detox and get rid of the toxins, then the fat will leave with the proper eating less, exercising more, doing all the right things. Just looking at numbers is not enough. Okay, so let's use me as an example. If I came to you and said, I have a sluggish metabolism, low thyroid, high cortisol, then it's always been hard for me to lose weight even though I'm very active, I try to keep my carb and sugar levels down. What are just a few specific things you might tell me to do? Most people don't know the best hours of sleep are nine or 10 at night to seven in the morning. Between nine and midnight, that's when your body naturally stimulates growth hormone and serotonin release, and it helps the balance of cortisol and burning. If you're a type A personality, Definitely. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> a type A personality, their sympathetic dominant, really, you know, uh, working on cortisol. I often refer them to a parasympathetic exercise program like yoga, Pilates, our method, walking, maybe swimming. So gentle, renewing, relaxing. You can stretch. You can build muscle, which we've got to have the muscle, and you can stimulate your serotonin, all with a parasympathetic. I actually learned that this year. I was doing an hour to an hour and a half of a really, really intense cardio, high intensity dance class. Once I found out I had high cortisol and started kind of thinking about exactly what you just said. If you're gonna do a high intensity, it should be 30 minutes, not 60. More yoga bar method type, which I love because I grew up dancing. Yeah. And it makes sense, it really does. Another thing that goes with that, but it isn't considered exercise, 
is, you know, mindfulness and meditation, which type A people have a hard time doing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Myself included. Going for a walk in the woods or working in my garden or whatever it is that I'm just being peaceful by myself quiets my mind and it relaxes everything. Putting in time, you know, half an hour in the morning before everyone else gets up or half an hour like, leave me alone. I'm just by myself right now reading, journaling, being. When you've got a high cortisol, and a lowered thyroid, too much cortisol will suppress thyroid. Oh, interesting. Uh, so with you or anyone like you, the profile is very typical, by the way, really upping the alkalinity in your diet. An alkaline diet comes from fruits and vegetables. We should be eating seven to 13 servings. You want to look at half your plate, half your day, fruits and vegetables. If someone has a sluggish metabolism, how do you feel about intermittent fasting? You know, I think it, it makes total sense. So many of my patients started doing it and got so much better. They loved how they felt, they lost weight. You're giving your system time to slow down. And so your body burns fat for energy when there isn't sugar. So any food, even protein or fat, stimulates insulin. So if we don't put food in, there's no insulin, and the body goes, you know, I need some energy. So I think I'll just take a little bit of fat. In a lot of instances, I think that intermittent fasting is a good thing. Not eating late at night and not even eating at night. If the dinner is earlier, then it gives you overnight to not be eating. It allows you to eat chocolate or have a glass of wine, but you just have it within a window so your body can then recover and do something. What would be your ideal day of eating? Protein, for sure, either in a, a shake, smoothie. I'm not a big whey person, so I like plant-based smoothies. I think eggs are good for us. A little bit of fat, a little bit of carb, a little bit of protein in every meal. The body likes that. I almost always start my day with an apple and a handful of nuts. I'm one of those believers in uh, a little snack. <laughs> between meals, a handful of nuts, a little yogurt. I'm not big on power bars. I, I think they're misleading. I would have a lunch that was bigger, a salad of some sort. And then the dinner, if it was a four to five or six, would be optimal. Lean protein, chicken, fish in particular. And one has to be mindful of how often they're eating meat, where it's coming from. Same thing with fish. Is it wild caught or is it farm raised? And I would say four ounces, no more. Four ounces would fit in the palm of your hand. Now, meat inherently is not bad for us. Clean though, not shot up with hormones. Best if it is free range, five, six servings of fruits and vegetables in a day. Minimal potatoes, they're so starchy, but they're delicious. Try not to snack at night, that's hard. And how many hours before you go to sleep would you recommend stop eating? Four. Four. Now that's tough. It's tough socially, but when you're home, I think it's more doable. It's much easier. And then speaking of social engagements, if people are drinking a few times a week, what are your guidelines to do that in a healthy way? Give me all of your, your thoughts. I think social alcohol a few a week is, is great. It spikes your blood sugar way too much if it's every day. And if it's later in the day, then number two, it's hard to sleep with certain beverages, especially wine. Vodka is easier on the blood sugar system. <laughs> this gets me very relieved. My favorite drink is Kettle One Botanicals, naturally infused with cucumber and there's no sugar, no nothing. So I'm glad to hear that you <laughs> agree. Awesome, wow. I do like every morning apple cider vinegar. Oh, it could be lemon juice or, or unsweetened cranberry okay. and some water and take that every morning and then wait an hour before breakfast. That is a cleanse and it's a very easy one. If one is drinking too much, really heavily pump greens, kale, spinach, everything green with chlorophyll, aloe juice is detoxifying. That's another reason to sleep, by the way, is overnight the liver cleanses all the blood. So if you're not sleeping enough, it can't do the whole body. What are your thoughts on cleanses? There's a million of them, and I, I think some women will use that as kind of a jump start or a reset. Do you think that that could be helpful, or do you think it's harmful? I think it's helpful. I don't like the master cleanse. I don't like the gallbladder cleanse. Some of those are way too intense, but even just 
apple cider vinegar with water or cranberry juice every day or a tad bit of honey in there. And then you can do a juice cleanse. You have to really dilute the juice or you can do water and cucumber. That's okay for a few days, but too much of it is not good. So I like it. I intersperse it. It depends on the person. Sometimes I'll say one day out of every four or, you know, give your body a break. In terms of women who are thinking about their fertility or thinking about getting pregnant, what are a few lifestyle changes that you would suggest? So sleep is very important. Water, of course, drinking, you know, half your body weight, six, eight ounce glasses a day of filtered water, minimizing alcohol. The more alkaline they are, the more fruits and vegetables, that's going to nourish the ovaries. The ovaries are very delicate, especially to stretch. If you're already exercising, keep it at that level. And then as you get further along in the pregnancy, if you go down with your exercise. For any woman, what yeah. do you say are some top foods to avoid? Anything with trans fats in them, heated oil, anything that's fried, that's hydrogenated, which is another trans fat like margarines, and chlorophyll, anything green helps. I also think right now, since we've been more sedentary, we've been home more, I feel like there's a lot of women who have gained a few pounds. What would be some of your tips for revving up a metabolism again? Well, one would be water, sculpting muscle, even the bar method or Pilates, right. where you can make long, thin, toned muscle. The muscle work is more important than the cardio. I think so. Now, cardio is so good for circulation, for serotonin release for your brain, and it does burn calories. I mean, I like a balance of all three. So stretch, strengthen, and cardio. Okay. However, if you had only a certain amount of time, I would do a combination of bar or Pilates, even yoga. You're actually doing the stretch and the cardio and the burn all at once. You're using every single muscle in your body. I've turned so many of my midlife women patients onto bar. Green tea, I think caffeine a little bit is okay. Also the, the intermittent snacking, it keeps your blood sugar even so it doesn't spike and go down. If your blood sugar goes up and then comes down, your zone of willpower is gone. And that's one of those sugar sweet things, pizza in the refrigerator, that is counter to revving your metabolism. In all of your practicing, have you found that there's a vitamin that most women that you see are deficient I in? I prefer to get vitamins from, you know, vegetables and fruits. So this isn't a vitamin, it's a mineral. Okay. Magnesium. Interesting. There's more than 400 things that magnesium does for us. It helps us to sleep, strengthens our bones, helps with nerve transmission muscle contraction, memory, helps the bowels to work. You need about 400 milligrams a day. And we don't get it from our food, even though it's in our food. That I find so many people need more of. I'm not a big fan of multivitamins. Some of the things don't work well together. Vitamin D, most of us are deficient. If you're younger and not having a lot of symptoms and just want to be taking care of yourself, I'd say about 2000 D a day. Okay. I was guessing that you might say vitamin D, but I didn't even think about magnesium. Well, good. You learned something. I really, oh, I'm learning. I'm learning all <laughs> kinds of things. Yeah. One thing we didn't talk about is having fun. Yeah. <laughs> you see, fun is very, very important. <laughs> Laughing. Fun is different for everybody. So we need to make time for ourselves. Sometimes you have to put it in your schedule. Is like, what would that be? A great movie, reading a book, going for a hike, being with friends. Even now, Zooming, I'm finding, is being fun. You know, where yes. we're um, like loving your dog, loving your husband. That stimulates endorphins, serotonin, and all those good hormones that are neurotransmitters that complement everything we've just talked about. Listen to your body. Your body tells you, sure. and don't let it go too long. Because we can get diagnoses very easily that, you know, we felt great and one day we go to the doctor and we get a diagnosis is totally unwanted. That's really good advice though, to ask for help the minute something feels off and to listen to yeah. it. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for talking to me. I learned so much. This was so, so helpful. Thank you for the opportunity. This was fun. Okay. All right.
Okay. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>